Mic check, test one, two. Test one, two. Mic check, test one, two. Test one, two. I would like to um, reconvene and welcome our distinguished uh, second panel. Uh, as with the first panel, of course, uh, uh, it is committee policy. Is this Mr. Randolph? Yes, it is. Oh, for, great, great. Um, to swear in all of our witnesses. So before you sit, Ms. Randolph, uh, let me stand and, raise, stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, of course, and the whole truth and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. Right, you may be seated. Let the record reflect that all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, Mr. Frank Rusco is the director of the Government Accountability Office of the National Resources and Environment Team. Mr. Rusco has been at GAO for 11 years and his work there focuses on energy issues, including oil and gas royalty collection and policy. We want to welcome you to the uh, committee. Then Ms. Mary Kendall has been at the Department of the Interior Office of the Inspector General since 1999. When she first served as Deputy Inspector General, Ms. Kendall became Acting Director in 2009. Before joining the Inspector General's office, Ms. Kendall served as an attorney 
at the Environmental Protection Agency for over a decade. We welcome you to the committee. Um, Ms. Danielle Bryan uh, has been the Executive Director of the Project on Government Oversight uh, since 1993. Ms. Bryan has led numerous investigations that have exposed wasteful government spending and helpful and uh, spending and helped bring policy reform to government programs. We also welcome you to the committee. Uh, Ms. Randolph is the parish president and of course uh, for uh, pronounced Lafouche. Yeah, thank you very much. I worked on that all night. <laughs> Uh, as well as serving as parish president, Ms. Randolph is the owner of a public relations and advertising uh, company and was previously an editor at the uh, Latouche uh, Le Gazette. We welcome you. At this time, I ask that each witness deliver uh, their five-minute uh, testimony, in which will allow us an opportunity to raise questions with you. And let me just sort of go through the procedure. You start out, the light is on green, then it goes to yellow, which means you have a minute to sum up, and then of course it's on red. And then at that time, the members will raise questions with you. So I would like to begin with you, Mr. Rusko, and for your five minutes and just come right down the line. And we're here again, we welcome you to the committee. Mr. Rusko, you may begin. Thank you, uh, Chairman Towns, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today about Interior's reorganization of the Minerals Management Service. This reorganization takes place in the context of the disastrous Deepwater oil spill, and it is hoped that some of the proposed changes to Interior's management of oil and gas will reduce the risks of future spills. It is also important, however, to recognize that Interior faces multiple challenges in effectively and efficiently managing its federal oil and gas program. Over the past five years, GAO and others have evaluated many aspects of Interior's management of oil and gas production on federal lands and waters and have found many def deficiencies. As a result, we have recommended numerous changes to the program. In fairness, Interior has responded to many of these recommendations with actions that we hope will result in improved efficiency and effectiveness. Many specific challenges remain, however, and we hope that Interior will keep its focus on addressing the deficiencies we have found, even as it undergoes organizational change. The findings and recommendations from GAO's recent evaluations are detailed in my written statement for the record. In the remainder of my oral comments, I want to discuss three key examples that illustrate a fundamental challenge for Interior. While each of the examples come from separate evaluations and will require separate actions to resolve, I hope that my discussion will make it clear that all three share an important common thread. Specifically, each of these problems illustrates the importance to Interior of keeping up with and, ad and adapting to change. First, until recently, Interior had gone over 25 years without fundamentally reevaluating its approach to leasing oil and gas properties. When we evaluated Interior's lease management practices, we found that Interior did less than other resource owners to encourage diligent development. Specifically, other resource owners did more than Interior to require or incentivize rapid development of promising oil and gas leases while offering more time for development of less promising or more speculative leases. Second, until recently, Interior had gone for over 20 years without fundamentally reevaluating its approach to collecting revenue for oil and gas production. When we evaluated Interior's approach in the context of what other resource owners do, we found that the federal government collected among the lowest levels of revenue from over 100 systems evaluated. Further, we found that because Interior's revenue collection system was inflexible to changes in oil and gas prices, that Interior was at an increased risk of succumbing to ad hoc changes to royalties in response to price changes. For example, in the mid-1990s, low oil and gas prices and pressure from oil companies led to royalty relief for deep water leases 
With the subsequent increase in oil and, oil and gas prices, this royalty relief will cost the federal government billions of dollars of lost revenue over the lifetime of the affected leases. Finally, in recent evaluations, we found that Interior's oil and gas program utilizes data systems that are mutually incompatible, lack key functionality, and lag far behind similar systems used by industry. This poses risk to the effective and efficient management of the oil and gas program and the collection of revenues. Part of the cause of these problems is that the IT systems were developed in a piecemeal fashion over a long period of time with little to no centralized oversight or planning. We are encouraged that Interior has begun recently to reevaluate its leasing policies, its revenue collection, and that Interior recognizes it faces significant IT challenges. However, the potential for future management problems will remain until and unless Interior adopts an effective risk-based approach that periodically evaluates and adapts to changes in the oil and gas industry, the practices of other resource owners, the IT environment, as well as other significant facets of oil and gas management. There is risk inherent in all activities and completely eliminating the risk associated with oil and gas development is not possible. However, if Interior builds risk management into its internal structure and applies it consistently to important management decisions over time, it can do much better at identifying risk and mitigating that risk to the extent possible. This is true regardless of how Interior is ultimately restructured, and Interior will not be fully successful until it addresses this fundamental challenge. This concludes my oral statement. I will be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you very much uh, for your statement. Um, Ms. Kendall. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the proposed reorganization of the Minerals Management Service. As you well know, we have identified in MMS programmatic weaknesses and some egregious misconduct. In the report released in May of this year, we found more of the same. Although the misconduct is considerably less salacious than that in our report issued in 2008 about misconduct in the Royalty and Kind program, both highlight a challenge that the successor agencies to MMS face. That is, the potential conflicts of a regulatory body that is inherently tied to the industry it regulates. I am concerned about the environment in which these federal employees operate and the ease with which they move between industry and government. I am also concerned about the conduct of industry representatives, that they should think it permissible to fraternize and provide federal government employees with gifts after all the media coverage about this practice is somewhat hard to fathom, but may be informed by the environment as well. While not included in our May 2010 report, we discovered that the individuals involved in the fraternizing and gift exchange, both government and industry, have often known one another since childhood. Their relationships were formed well before they joined industry or government. MMS has relied upon the ability to hire employees with industry, and ex industry experience. With the announcement that MMS will be reorganized, the department is poised to reconsider some of our recommendations for programmatic improvement. These must, however, be bolstered with an emphasis on ethics to include controls and strong oversight. Let me focus on the last element of strong oversight. In the fall of 2008, Inspector General Earl Devaney testified before the House Committee on Natural Resources, which is a correction to my written testimony, describing what was then a fledgling office within the Office of Inspector General, now called our Royalty Initiatives Group. Since that time, we have also established an investigative unit dedicated to energy issues and have expanded our oversight coverage beyond MMS to the energy and minerals programs at the Bureau of Land Management. Until recently, these two offices have been dedicated to royalties-related oversight and improvements. Since the events of April 20th, however, it has become increasingly clear that we must expand their scope to provide oversight of the operational, environmental, safety, inspection, and enforcement aspects of energy production on federal lands and in the Outer Continental Shelf. We are also hopeful that the newly created Investigation and Review Unit will provide an additional element of oversight to the successor MMS agencies. 
The OIG is to a significant degree reactive in our investigative efforts. We hope that the IRU will provide continuous compliance review of the program offices to identify potential weaknesses before they become serious problems. We also rely on the bureaus to conduct internal investigations and reviews of allegations which simply do not rise to the level of OIG attention. The IRU will be a dedicated point of contact to which we can refer such matters. Presently, the Office of Inspector General is well into a multi-pronged effort to address multiple areas of concern relative to offshore drilling. We have dedicated most of our central region staff to this undertaking. We are also participating in the investigations being led by the Department of Justice into the events that led to the disaster on the Deepwater Horizon and the catastrophic events following. In addition to these efforts, we will continue building our oversight capacity beyond royalties into the areas of safety and oversight of drilling operations, both on and offshore. The ongoing OIG efforts regarding OCS safety and environmental concerns are also addressing a two-pronged request from Secretary Salazar. First, to the Outer Continental Shelf Safety Oversight Board, a body created by secretarial order on April 30th of this year. The Secretary requested that the Board make recommendations to improve and strengthen the Department's overall management, regulation, and oversight of OCS operations. Second, the Secretary asked the OIG to address specific deficiencies in MMS policies or practices that need to be addressed to ensure that operations in the OCS are conducted safely, protective of human life, health, and the environment. Since these two requests were so similar in scope, the OIG effort will respond twofold to these requests by the Secretary. While we will provide the Safety Oversight Board our findings and recommendations by mid-August, we have already found several areas that call for further review, and we will continue to pursue these to conclusion. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my prepared testimony today, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, and I appreciate your testimony, uh, Ms. Bryan. Thank you, Chairman, for inviting me to testify. I also want to thank Ranking Member Issa and Representative Maloney for their unrelenting oversight of this troubled agency. We've been working with Representative Maloney for about 15 years on this issue. MMS was created in 1982 because royalty collections had been buried inside the USGS, yet the oversight functions again were buried in MMS beneath their other mission of promoting oil and gas production. If there is any silver, small silver lining to the Gulf disaster, it, it is that it has called attention to long-needed reforms. And while the reorganization is a good step, we have real concerns about its implementation and whether those who are planning uh, it are really consulting the appropriate stakeholders. We also have to fix the frequency with which officials have gone through the revolving doors. It has been discussed many times this morning, but I really think the egregious example of the two recent MMS directors going to become presidents of an offshore drillers association needs a little bit further discussion because the MMS director was joining a trade association whose explicit mission was to secure, quote, a favorable regulatory environment for offshore oil and gas drillers. Yet they were the very regulators when they had been working in the public sector. So you have to ask whose interests were they actually serving when they were the regulator. There have been several major improvements to ethics at Interior and further steps to slow the revolving door are in legislation passed by both the Senate Energy and House Natural Resources Committees. We do hope the House's stronger provision is soon passed into law. The second problem is that MMS has always been dependent on industry for technical knowledge and allowed industry to operate largely on what the GAO described as an honor system. Representative Maloney's legislation will significantly help MMS gain back some of its upper hand. When it comes to inspectors, it's hard for Interior to attract and keep the talent it needs when inspectors are starting as GS7. And this is a very important point. There's so much emphasis on the revolving door, which is very important for us to be focusing on. But if we only look at that and not on how we're compensating those who are working as inspectors, I think it's a huge problem. Pogo's learned of one inspector, for example, who after three years on the job has still had no training. So we need to be investing in these inspectors. The last inspection conducted on the Deepwater Horizon was performed by an inspector who is still in training. The government must establish federal training academies, like those for mine safety and the FBI, to ensure that inspectors both on and offshore are receiving regular training not paid for or run by industry. 
So changing the culture requires more than reorganization, and it requires more than new leadership. They will need to dig deep into the management of the agency. And no matter what reforms are put in place, they can only be effective with increased transparency about MMS's operations. Despite the administration's open government directive, which has focused on each agency providing new information to the public, Interior, for example, has only focused on disclosures of things like the nation's national treasures, which were already online anyway, rather than information about oil and gas leases. The kind of information we all need to know coming from Interior are the kinds of things that policymakers would learn if we actually started investigating and talking to them, some of the people on, online. For example, even after the Deepwater Horizon explosion, inspector concerns are still being ignored. For example, an MMS inspector discovered that a deep water production facility was operating days after he had issued a cease and desist order because he believed it was in dangerous noncompliance. When he contacted his supervisor for approval to issue another order, his supervisor overruled him. And this is in the wake of the Gulf crisis. We've learned that this incident is not unique but has become a common practice where inspectors feel they need to ask permission from their supervisors because they are more likely to get in trouble for issuing an incident of noncompliance than for not issuing one. There, this is where the real work will have to happen, changing that culture. MMS inspectors are just beginning to speak out, despite the fact that they have no real whistleblower protections. And I can tell you with experience that MMS has been a hostile place for whistleblowers. If there's another takeaway from the disaster, it's that whistleblower protections for federal employees are urgently needed and would be offered through the legislation sponsored by Representatives Van Hollen and Pat Platts, the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act. Ultimately, MMS must reorganize its priorities to serve taxpayers and protect their resources and not industry. As an important first step, Congress must enact H.R. 3534 and S. 3516. Thank you again for your oversight of MMS, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Randolph. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On May 8th, oil first appeared on the shores of our parish from the Deepwater Horizon blowout, an event caused by reckless, tragic, disastrous decisions made by BP personnel who obviously did not follow established safety guidelines. We have now endured 74 days of relentless effort to protect our wet wetlands and our wildlife. Birds don't fly, fish don't swim, and fishermen can't make a living. Then came the moratorium on deep water drilling, literally adding insult to injury. Research conducted by the LSU Center for Energy Studies has revealed that this moratorium, suspension, pause, ban, whatever the term du jour is, will not only impact a few parishes in Louisiana, 43 in Florida, 42 in Texas, Louisiana 32, and Mississippi 7. In the Department of the Interior's own report, DOI estimated about 120,000 jobs would be lost. Nine of the top ten taxpayers in Lafouche Parish are located at Port Fouchon, which services all 33 rigs singled out in the initial moratorium. The spill has decimated the fishing industry. The moratorium will essentially end life as we know it in our parish. No business can survive a six-month pause and this much uncertainty. Up to 40 percent of our property tax base could be lost by 2012 as a result of the drilling ban. Rig owners have stated in testimony to the President's Commission on the Oil Spill that they intend to leave the Gulf for other opportunities elsewhere in the world. Some service company employees have been offered transfers to locations in other states. Families are now making decisions as to whether the husband and father or the wife and mother will live elsewhere, with the rest of the family staying behind to finish schooling. These are the lucky ones. The rest will be terminated. In Lafouche, that could be 10,000 people. The span is sending a mixed message. In April 2010, the unemployment rate in our parish was 4.4 percent, the lowest in the nation. By November 30th, the stated end of the moratorium, the number of unemployed will increase dramatically. In this country, a whole lot of money has been borrowed to create jobs to stimulate the economy. People in Lafouche Parish and those associated with the oil and gas industry and its support services are, are not expendable Americans. We fuel this country. 
On May 28th, I had the opportunity to personally ask President Obama to reconsider his decision based on the de devastating economic blow we would suffer. He declined, but he did offer to send down an economic team to assess the moratorium's impact on our parish. Again, that was May 28th. The team will arrive July 26th. President Obama, in early May, we have announced that no permits for drilling new wells will go forward until the 30-day safety and environmental review I requested is complete. That was the first intense scrutiny of the industry. Some of these commissioners disagreed with the moratorium decision, yet it was established anyway. The President formed another commission with its members asked to restudy this for at least six months. We will die a slow death. Statistics indicate that an oil tanker has four times greater chance of spilling its cargo than an oil well has of blowing out. Tankers from around the world carrying up to three million barrels of oil traverse the Gulf all the way to the port of Houston daily. 11,000 tankers traversed the Gulf last year. The moratorium's own language emphasizes the shortage of resources available to respond to another spill in the Gulf as a reason for pause. In order to resume activities, operators must submit evidence that they have the ability to respond effectively to a potential spill. There are those who call for an immediate halt to oil and gas. What is being overlooked in the rationale behind the suspension is that all of these tankers traverse the Gulf. Based upon the rationale behind the new moratorium on deepwater drilling issued July 13th by the Secretary of the Interior, I am today challenging the President, Secretary Salazar, and the federal government to protect all Gulf states from another spill as completely as possible. Stop all, all tanker traffic in the Gulf of Mexico. Mr. Chairman, I, I await your questions. Thank you very much, and I really appreciate um, you know, your um, testimony. And uh, let me begin by um, with you, Ms. Bryan. You said something that I want to make certain that I understand. That you said dig deep into the management. What do you mean by that? I'm concerned that what we're dealing with now is really sort of the top layer. And what we've learned over the many years of looking at MMS is that a bulk of the problem is still there just because you change the people at the top. And we see that there are, we've known for years about the auditors who had been uh, stifled by their supervisors and now we're learning about inspectors with the same kinds of problems where the mid-management is still in line and, and nothing's really changed from that perspective. So changing the name didn't get us there? Breaking it apart and changing the name is just not enough. Okay. Ms. Randolph, before I um, uh, move any further, I want to know in terms of how big is a parish? How many people? We have 95,000 people, sir. How many? We have 95,000 people, sir. Is that an elected position? Mine, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that sounds like mine. <laughs> <laughs> you have to run for it. Yeah. Yes. Um, Mr. Rusko and, Ms., and, and, and I guess and Ms. Bryan, I want to ask, and, and probably and you too, Ms. Kendall, uh, do you think that the proposed reorganization plan can successfully reform MMS? I'm, I'm sorry, the current, the current proposed plan? Yes. Um, can well, we reform it and, yeah. and, 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 do I, where we, and, and get us where we need to go? I saw they heard Ms. Bryan on it, but you know. Yeah, our, our position on that is that, that there have been in the last five years dozens, over a hundred recommendations to address specific deficiencies that, that have been identified. And um, we've looked deeply at, at, the, at the process and found deficiencies everywhere we look. So all of those must be addressed for for um, interior to effectively manage oil and gas program but uh, that's true no matter what the organization is changing the organization will not implement automatically those uh, those needed reforms and so it, it, they're, they're going to have to do both if, if they want to reform their if they're going to reorganize they're also going to have to implement all of the reforms. Ms. Kendall, you want to add? I share the sentiment of both Mr. Rusko and Ms. Bryan that reorganization in and of itself is not an answer to resolving profound management um, challenges. 
um, the, it's it will be in the implementation and the other um, reforms that the department makes relative to the management of oil and gas leasing oversight and royalty collection if, yes, if, I, if I could add a little more meat to my overall comment on that, uh, while we certainly agree that, that splitting up that conflict in mission is an essential change, mm -hmm. it also could create more problems because what we now have are three smaller agencies inside a bureaucracy. And as we know, as we're all sort of students of government, it's all about how big you are in the government and how powerful you are. So now you have smaller entities, and we're particularly worried from the audit perspective. We have been thinking for some time that uh, there may be some efficiencies created by looking at those small audit shops across the federal government and thinking about housing them in one place where you'd actually create an efficiency and have, uh, have them actually be an entity where there is more value added, uh, value placed on their role as auditors, for example. The other thing that worries us is um, that, that some of the people who really need to be at the table as we're talking about this uh, reorganization aren't there. The states and tribes that MMS is responsible for collecting royalties from are not adequately being uh, consulted and uh, participating in the process, and that's a great concern to us as well. You know, does the Department of Interior have the expertise uh, to be able to do the kind of monitoring and, uh, and oversight that we really uh, expecting? Well, because they, I'm looking at GS7, that's uh, what thirty-eight thousand dollars a year. Isn't that awful? Yeah, to yeah, think I of mean, the uh, responsibility that we're placed on them, and we're so undervaluing them by how much we're paying them. The other part of what we think is important that hasn't been on the table at all yet is BLM at Interior also is conducting these inspections, and we're not talking about them. So shouldn't there be some conversation about at least merging those missions in, in one? Uh, entity as well. So I think there's a lot of important things that should be part of the conversation that haven't been yet. Right. Do you think they have the expertise? Um, <clears throat> no, we have we've found many uh, cases in which the level of, of expertise, the level of training, and uh, just the sheer number of people to do the job are inadequate for especially for in the, in the inspection uh, area and in the area of petroleum engineers to to evaluate drilling plans and to to evaluate uh, processes right i guess my five minutes is up i don't think you started the clock so uh Mr. Chairman, I'd ask unanimous consent. You have all the time of the other members here <laughs> on your side. I'd be delighted to take it, but I'll yield five minutes to you before we do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, like the chairman, I, I think you know there's no limit to the amount of, of questions we'd like to ask each of you. I'll start with uh, Mrs. Randolph. I asked Secretary Salazar a moment ago, uh, or an hour ago now, about why an arbitrary six months rather than when the existing well, which is certainly a danger until it's killed, once it's killed, why he couldn't reconsider uh, at that moment changing. And he gave me an answer that over the next six weeks, eight weeks, he was going to have all these studies come back. You've seen the president make a personal promise to you. You have sat there watching people be laid off in an industry that is not being compensated at all for being laid off. They're not like the fishermen. The, uh, the oil men themselves are just on their own if they get laid off. They cannot go to Mr. F uh, Feinberg to ask for any money because they're not part of the, quote, affected directly. What do you need to see from this administration in order to have the confidence that they care enough about Louisiana to actually put people back to work? Well, the immediate response would be to lift the moratorium. Um, and, but and do you agree with the premise that if Secretary Salazar were to reconsider a date shorter, that when, this, when uh, the well is actually killed, which hopefully will be in a matter of weeks, that that might be the appropriate time to say, okay, it no longer is a danger, therefore resources could be available, therefore we could lift the ban. Would you be satisfied if he used that instead of uh, six months and then we'll relook at it with no expectation that that would be a hard, hard reopening? We would be very satisfied with that. That would be a finite date. Uh, the industry itself could make decisions based upon that date, and therefore we would not lose all the service company jobs that are associated with it. Yes, some, but but my 
concern this morning is this Mr. Ballmer talked about another study that begins or, or additional hearings that begin on August 4th and end on September 15th with a report due on October 31st. So it, it's an, another study that, that doesn't provide us any direction. Well, and unfortunately, uh, that'll be two days before or three days before the uh, midterm elections. I suspect no one's going to look at them until after that day, too. Uh, Ms. Bryan, you and I have worked together on transparency and will yes, continue to. Uh, Mrs. Randolph particularly uh, has experience about ghost assets, all the parishes do, where <clears throat> there are claims in writing that X amount of skimmers, X amount of, of various assets are brought to bear, and then we find out they actually weren't there. And we, to be honest, do not know if the total number of skimmers that each were claimed is greater than the total number of skimmers ever contracted. Do you have any better transparency at all? Have you been able to get any better uh, information on what the real assets that brought to bear were? And, and if not, why do you think you're not seeing it? I, we have not had any better access to information. We do think that there's a tremendous problem with the lack of transparency <coughs> in this entire cleanup operation. I think part of the problem is there has been a, uh, an acceptance <coughs> that BP was in charge for a long time and sort of leaving it to the private sector, which we really believe this is something where the government should be in charge and making all information uh, public to the general public. And that just hasn't been the case. Well, you know, one of the interesting things that I discovered with the chairman when we went down there is that they run consensus management, uh, which is a nice way of saying one group's in charge, except really they're not in charge. It takes everyone to have a decision. <clears throat> Therefore, nobody's really accountable. <laughs> Therefore, the decision to release is probably beyond the expertise of everybody. Uh, it's no way to run a railroad. Uh, I guess I'm going to sort of pose to both of you for a second. Uh, and, and, I, and I think, Mr. Rusko, because of your, your past studies, I think you see it, but you've both been asked, this reorganization, if you will, moving the deck chairs on the Titanic, doesn't it inherently delay the ability of the organization, while they're busy reorganizing, from getting to the various failures that both of you have seen in past uh, inspections and studies? That is a concern that we have. We're, we're we know that organizational change is, is very difficult, it's disruptive, and, and it, it, it takes a lot of uh, agency resources. And uh, at the same time, they're dealing with a, this catastrophic oil spill. They're also dealing with trying to uh, do the work that, that they feel they need to before they can lift the moratorium. And, they, and then they have this backlog of, of uh, recommendations that they're trying to address to improve their systems. It, it, is, um, it is a concern. Uh, Ms. Kendall, uh, same for you, I assume, that it's very hard for, for your various IGs and so on to <clears throat> the people that work for you to actually figure out who you're supposed to look at and what you're supposed to oversee if the chairs are moving around. Uh, I'm assuming that one of the problems right now is you really don't know which one of these three entities to focus on. Is that correct? Just during the reorganization. During the reorganization. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, what we're what we're really trying to do is focus on issue areas, um, but following those issue areas as they're being moved around has not yet become a challenge because the actual movement hasn't taken place. But I imagine it would be in the future. One one quick last question, if I could, Chairman. Uh, you know, the the chairman and I enjoy the title of oversight and reform. <clears throat> and the theory of that is that Congress has an absolute right uh, to, if you will, intervene in the organization of government. Congress actually authorizes who gets to be a cabinet or not. We created the, uh, the cabinet position for Homeland Security and so on. If, if the GAO were tasked in combination with this committee to look at the various revenue entities not just in the Department of Interior, but primarily in Department of Interior, uh, the various, well, it would include the IRS, so it would clearly be outside, the various parts of inspection that go on throughout the government, but particularly Department of Interior, uh, <coughs> and of course contracting, and ask the bigger question of, should this entity really be truly consolidated with other areas of, if you will, cultural uh, excellence by comparison. Do you believe that's something you could deliver at least a preliminary report back to us during this Congress? 
In other words, are the basic facts of these other entities, their existence, uh, for consideration by this committee something that we could begin working on before uh, the lights go out uh, at the end of uh, December? Uh, I think it's something we we would be willing to talk to your staff about. I, I hate to commit at this point to okay. anything without further information. Well, Mr. Chairman, there's, a, there's more than enough if there's a second round, but, but that would be something that I'd like to have our staffs explore is, is whether we could take an active role in looking at a much larger reorganization, uh, particularly uh, when it comes to the, the following, which is I heard the GS7, and I appreciate that, but I happen to know that the inspectors go up to about $100,000, their GS 13s, 14. So there, there are some people that are paid relatively well and, in fact, paid better than their counterparts in the Corps of Engineers who oversee, you know, public construction, including NASA. So with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Right. And I'd also like to add maybe we need to look at terms of um, the stability in terms of, you know, how long people actually stay with the agency. I think that's uh, another issue that Absolutely. we need to um, uh, consider a as well. At this time, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, all of you were here for the first panel. You listened in on the questioning. Uh, I was intrigued by Mr. and I wanted to ask Secretary Salazar some questions, but just because of votes, wasn't able to get back in time before he was dismissed. But I was intrigued by uh, Congressman Turner's timeline prior to the terrible accident uh, in the Gulf, the Deepwater Horizon. Um, so I want, I want your thoughts. Do, do you, I mean, obviously BP is at fault here and we understand that, but um, do you believe, well, let me go back to this. <clears throat> in Mr. Turner's timeline, he referenced four different occasions where standard inspections were not performed. So I, I want your thoughts. Do you believe that this accident could have been prevented if MMS would have done those inspections? And we'll just go down the, go down the line. It's difficult to say, but I, but I think that, that there's a bit of a misconception about what these inspections are about. Uh, most of the inspections <clears throat> that take place on rigs offshore are dealing with uh, safety of equipment, such as railings, stairways, slippery surfaces. They're dealing with environmental issues, such as any, any noticeable leaks of, of uh, hydrocarbons, and they're dealing with production verification issues, looking to make sure that the, that the, um, uh, the metering is done correctly and that there are no bypasses of meters and, and that everything is accounted for. So you're for. saying that those inspections, people aren't actually out on the, out on the facility in, in, in the, the equipment itself? Or? The, they're, they're out there and they also do look at records. They, they, look, at, okay. they look at records of, uh, to, to ensure that the approved plans are being followed and they have, you know. Well, but certainly it, the fact that if those inspections would have been done, there would have been a better chance to detect those problems. Fair I, statement? I, I, I can't argue with that. Yeah. Ms. Kendall? 